Well, a few things. Today and tomorrow we have class on the Vitara Tantra Shastra. And then those of you who are attending classes should be the Sangha members who are on the rotas, as well as our post-class presentation group. All of our staff members, I think it's better for you to stay at home and receive the classes. Now the rest of you, I think it's better for us not to have too many people gathered at one place. It may be more convenient, and the rest of you can receive classes at home. It seems that when I require you to stay at home and listen to classes, people tend to not listen. And when I ask you to come to the shrine hall and receive classes, and people tend to like to, like to stay at home. When I ask you to stay here, you like to go. And when I ask you to go, you like to stay here. I think it's better to maintain this uh, group of uh, this number of group of people uh, in the shrine hall during summer. Now, Uttara Tantra Shastra. Back in 2019, which was two years ago, on October 26th, we paused our class. That was our last class. I flipped back to my journal and uh, tried to uh, remember what it was like for me, and I'll share that with you. In the morning of 26th October 2019, I give I held a meeting for 200 staff members who worked at the uh, Lotus Continent Library, and I give them some requirements and talk to them about my expectations for them working over there and serve the others. And then I give teaching, and then we had a meeting uh, with the with the caring group over here in Larongar, and we talked about the hygiene and health of women, especially Tibetan women. And then I had another meeting with the Jumos and Lamas, where we talked about building a small fund uh, that would uh, particularly uh, contribute 50,000 RMB uh, to uh, certain um, areas of the monastery and 20,000 to the lay practitioner center. And then I had another meeting with the uh, budget construction budget group where we talked about uh, specific numbers. <laughs> We also discussed that we should firm our confirm our budget in the spring next year. So that was the afternoon, and then in the evening I gave teachings on Uttara Tantra, Tantra Shastra. Back then there was thirty thousand. Uh, 34,230 uh, people attending online, and then I received 153 uh, visitors who came in front of my throne to receive blessings, uh, out of which 57 were Tibetans and uh, 93 were Han Chinese. Uh, I was very happy. I'm very happy that I finally I finished the uh, teaching for this year, may the protectors bless me so that uh, I can give teachings next year as planned. Uh, there was a, a great snow in the morning, which was the first snow in this year, and then there was another snow in the evening. Maybe the protectors didn't give us the correct blessings, that's why we didn't resume the class last year. Anyhow, let's resume now. The unsurpassed, profound, and wonderful Dharma is difficult to encounter in billions of eons. I now see it, hear it, receive it, and uphold it. I vow to fathom the Tathagata's true meaning. Chung and Tina, Tum Tirpa, 
লি হাই ইমথে দ্রুই সের লি তন তে তেলা মাবা তার থমেদ কেনার নাম্বা না নোম 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 কি তুম দেখ তুন্দ্রো লাইন জিগনি তেবজন তে থার সেবি তুন্দ থাপ থাপতুম জাত চির তেবজন র্যারা ছুটন তো চির গোমেদ গোমেদ দিগনি সিনারকি মৃদু জন বাংলাদেশ নগসের শুরুর খেপে রে সাতক সের সেপার দেবজন কমছিন তকি সেবি ইম খেনজের নে ছু সাথ সানদেব নাম জুম্বাবজন রঞ্চন কোরলোয়ীজন সেমচন কামনাজর থকমা মেপা নে সেমজি রামজন ট্রমে থকমা মেপা ইম্বর জুত Now, let us resume our class on Uttara Tantra Shastra. Now we do not have live broadcasting anymore. We do not have any uh, classes or any online webcastings anymore. I used to have this website that's called Wisdom Compassion website, but it is uh, uh, no longer available. I do not have any other platforms where um, it can broadcast my teachings. So I'm simply giving the teachings to all of us who are present here, and I will give the teachings of the later part of Uttara Tantra Shastra. The previous part, we've already uh, finished learning. We've already talked about the uh, Buddha nature, how it resides in the sentient being's mind stream. We've covered that part. Some parts are more easier to understand and some parts are a little bit more difficult. But the teachings on Buddha nature, if we were to uh, explore, to research, to um, contemplate, then it would definitely be very, very beneficial to recognize our Buddha nature, which is of crucial importance to all sentient beings. 
Would tell Tantra Shastra, even if you just simply listened to certain verses of this teaching, the merit would be great. I've quoted from the um, part that's included in the merit in the chapter on merit. And I would like you to then remember that part. It talked about the merit that's generated by listening and contemplating other verses of Wudhar Tantra Shastra would surpass the merit of making offering to innumerable Tadagadas. And it talked about how the merit would surpass that of by meditating, so on and so forth. Even if you just simply listen to a class like this, the merit that you can gain is indeed immeasurable and surpass the kind of merit that you can accumulate in a long period of time, even if you were to practice by uh, making offering, by practicing generosity, by practicing uh, observing precepts and meditation. So let us generate the joyful mind and listen to the class on Uttara Tantra Shastra, the teaching on Buddha nature. Some of the teachings are simple, easy to understand and accept, and some parts are difficult. But if you were to persist on the path of learning and contemplation, you will definitely be able to understand the profound teachings in this text. Therefore, let us generate a joyful mind and receive this teaching. Throughout listening to this teaching, maybe you're listening to it to this class um, in person, or maybe you're listening to it through recording or other methods, you will still be able to attain the same merit. Now, uh, previously, we've already covered uh, seven out of the nine similes, uh, which include how um, the Buddha nature is like the Buddha statue being covered by the shroud of the lotus or the honey and the bee, as well as the seed inside of the uh, shell the treasure underneath the ground, fruit or rather the seed um, covered by the peel or fruit covered by the peel. So we've already covered six out of nine and today let's move on to the next simile which is the seventh. It is the simile of just like a tethered rag that uh, covering a precious precious a Buddha statue. Out of the nine similes, in fact, the nine similes of Buddha nature is very famous, very popular, and it is taught with great clarity inside of the Uttara Tantra Sutra, or the Buddha nature sutra, rather because it is connected or taught with different stories as well, demonstrated with different stories. So now we can see this teaching, where it gives a teaching on every sentient being have uh, Buddha nature. This is really important. In Tibet, over 95% of the Tibetans, maybe by their faith, maybe by the tradition, everyone would hold great belief that every sentient being has Buddha nature. And 95, over 95% of people in Tibet, they would uh, believe in past and future lives as well. This is common knowledge, really. And people don't feel very strange. They wouldn't feel that, oh, Buddha nature, everyone has Buddha nature, really? They wouldn't feel that way at all. They wouldn't feel that uh, there's no past and future life. They wouldn't generate any doubts. 
But for people in other areas, let it be because of the different be uh, education background and the different environment that you live in, for example, in Han, China, in the mainland China, the teaching of Buddha nature is brought by Master Fasian, who translated, uh, who translated Maha Parinirvana Sutra. And this sutra, with his translation, he translated the first half and then part of the second half. I did not look into it very closely, but we can see that even in the Tibetan version of the Mahaparinirvana uh, Sutra, there is a part that is missing as well. After his translation, because within that teaching, it talked about each Antikas, the ones who have already, um, who have uh, no virtuous root at all. And because of such uh, each Antikas, or such explanation of this, People, believe, uh, people believed that each Antikas have no chance of being liberated and have no Buddha nature. Before Kumara Jiva, there, uh, before Kumara Jiva's uh, translation, there was one disciple of Kumara Jiva, uh, Master Daoshan, and he then debated on whether each Antikas have Buddha nature, and he thinks that they still do. Later he was expelled, by, uh, expelled and rejected by the other masters and thought that he was giving the wrong teaching. So uh, he went to the area in around the south, uh, southern China, mid southern China, and uh, he <laughs> once talked to a rock and telling or giving teaching of Mahaparinirvana uh, Sutra to the rock, and the rock agreed to him that all sentient beings have um, Buddha nature. Therefore, there's a story or a saying say, uh, in the Han Buddhism saying that uh, the Master Han's teaching would make the rock agree with, them, with him. In the continuum of sentient beings, there is Buddha nature. And because of that teaching, uh, because of the teaching of uh, Master Han and his teaching being propagated and got popular, uh, so the general understanding of all sentient beings that have Buddha nature uh, is now very well known in mainland area. So the kind of doubts, however, uh, the kind of doubts uh, whether sentient beings or all sentient beings have Buddha nature is still quite common. In our studies, I really hope that all of you could understand the profundity of each of the similes. So let's move on to today's teaching on this seventh simile. In each of the simile, there are uh, the um, particular simile and then the meaning of it. An image of the victorious one made from precious materials uh, lies by the road wrapped in an evil-smelling tethered rag. Upon seeing this, a, a god will alert the past um, alert the past by to his presence by the road to cause its retrieval. Well, if there's a, a Buddhist statue that's made of the seven treasures, but is covered by a smelly tethered rag and being discarded at an intersection at rather a very a deserted area. People might tread on top of it and ignore it. According to Buddha Nature Sutra, it says that there was once a passenger who wrapped his precious statue in tethered rag 
Later, this person unfortunately passed away, but his uh, tethered uh, rag wrapped sculpture uh, has been lying there for a long period of time. But at that time, the celestial being through the divine eye saw that there's a tr there's a, a Buddhist statue made of various treasures, and that's how the other people uh, discovered it. People didn't think that such a precious material could be covered by such tethered rag. During Cultural Revolution, the Tibetans um, couldn't see the Buddha statues at all, and it was very dangerous to hide Buddha statues at the time, so we would use really uh, smelly and tethered rag to, uh, to wrap it up and hide it. And usually underneath the tent uh, in Tibetan area, we would staff the, um, the firewoods and all of those things underneath the tent. But that's how we would hide it. It, it shouldn't be hid over there um, because statues should be placed at a higher place, but it was due to the special circumstances. Also, we would hide it um, underneath seats and underneath uh, different areas uh, where are not seen by the inspectors. So it was a way to conceal the secrets, uh, but now it's no longer secrets anymore. It's uh, been 20, 30 years ago. Over here, he talked about how the celestial beings, upon seeing the precious statue that's concealed in this tethered rag, and then reveal what is inside of that tethered rag. The passengers or people over there would be able to receive and have such a precious statue. So that's the meaning of this uh, simile. What's the meaning that corresponds to this simile then? It says that likewise, being possessed of unhindered vision, the Buddha sees the substance of a sukata wrapped in the multitudes of the mental poisons, even the animals, and teaches the means to free it. Since the Buddha is omniscient and he's the knower of the truth, so with his unobstructed wisdom, he sees the uh, mind stream of all the sentient beings of the three realms. Upon observing all these sentient beings' mind stream, the Buddha saw that the uh, beings are covered by afflictions, the three uh, poisons just like how the treasured statue is wrapped up in tethered rags. And Tathagatagarbha, in fact, is not only inside human beings, rather it is also uh, in the uh, beings' mind stream, such as hungry ghosts and uh, celestial beings and the animals and insects. In fact, all sentient beings have this uh, Buddha nature. So the Buddha, through his teachings, uh, of by turning the wheel of Dharma, he taught all sentient beings the various methods of rediscovering their Buddha nature. This is the teaching of Buddha nature given by the Buddha. All sentient beings all the way from insects to human beings to celestial beings, all possess Buddha nature. According to the Jewel Forest of Dharma Garden, it says that though the human beings and animals are different, however, they all possess Buddha nature. There is no difference in the Buddha nature that they possess. There are the animals uh, who are reborn as animals just because of their negative uh, karmic retribution. Therefore, they take up such kind of a, a different form than human beings. However, all kinds of sentient beings, they have the same Buddha nature, and that has uh, really no difference. All the way from, uh, if we were to look at the birds, um, in fact, we cannot see the track of the birds flying by. 
as human beings. So, similarly, um, people without divine eye cannot see the Buddha nature that's intrinsic in all sentient beings. Therefore, all of the beings, we cannot see their Buddha nature because we don't have divine eyes. Um, and then we would generate doubts, and some people would generate doubts like such. Just like nowadays uh, in the movies, we can see that people would say that, well, if there are uh, next lifetime, I would do so and so. It is only because they cannot see, because they don't have divine eyes. I think Buddhist practitioners are like such as well. Um, the Buddhist, some of the Buddhist practitioners would say that, oh, if I were to be reborn again, I would liberate sentient beings. Well, this is so sad. As a Buddhist, if you don't believe in past and future lives, uh, this is really sad. In fact, from the ultimate aspect, the Buddha nature is constant. It stays from the uh, mundane beings and uh, all the way to Buddhahood. You can call it alaya, you can call it the mind continuum, you can call it consciousness. In fact, this kind of mind continuum is there. Is, uh, it has the same existence just uh, as a human beings, uh, no matter if you're a human being or an animal. So over here, um, we can see this is the meaning to explain or further explain uh, the simile. And now uh, let's look at both combined. The both combined is uh, rather quite long in terms of the Tibetan translation. Usually the Tibetan verse is uh, about seven to nine seven to nine words, but this particular verse has 15 words in it. Um, so I'm not quite sure if it's supposed to be a verse uh, originally, or uh, maybe it was part of the commentary, or uh, maybe it's a, a passage. Anyhow, this is a repeated, this is rather a repeated um, version to explain the previous uh, simile and uh, meaning. The great masters from the past um, have been teaching this based on um, taking it as a verse. Nowadays, uh, there are the there are the um, Sanskrit scholars who retranslated this, and then they also would use it as uh, they would uh, translate it as a verse as well. So the meaning is similar, except it is worded differently to further explain the previous um, simile and the meaning. Well, in fact, all of the um, teachings uh, throughout this part has been taught in a similar way. Previously, we've also uh, studied that. On top of that, the Indian, um, the traditional Indian um, composition is different than those of the Tibetans. So um, usually how it goes is that it goes with the verses and then verses and they use verses to combine it and explain it again. So maybe it's a difference of the formats. Anyhow, over here it says that when his eye perceives the statue of the Tathagata, which is of precious nature, but wrapped in a stinky rag and lying by the road, the god points uh, the, the god points it out by uh, to pass by, so that the passerby would be able to retrieve it. Likewise, the victors sees the element or the Buddha nature wrapped in the tethered garments of the poisons and lying on samsara's road. It presents even within animals and teaches the Dharma so that it may be re uh, released. 
People nowadays would wrap uh, all kinds of wrapping papers and uh, wrapping papers on top of wrapping papers when they're mailing out a parcel, and then put all those all those wrappings and the statue uh, in a box and then place it uh, at an intersection. But people won't touch it because it's just a random box. However, the beings with divine eyes, they would see through that kind of tethered rag and know that there is a treasured statue that's hidden within. So uh, the ones with divine eyes would point it out to the passerby so that they can reveal it, reveal the statue within. Therefore, similarly, the great victorious one, that is the Buddha, sees the element or the Buddha nature within all sentient beings. However, it is wrapped in the tethered garments of the mental poisons and the sentient beings lying in uh, lying on samsara's road. He sees that even abides within animals and teaches the Dharma so that it may be released from uh, these rags of mental poisons. The Buddha taught many different uh, many different teachings or from many different angles, the different Dharma doors to sentient beings so that the sentient beings can release such element that is Buddha nature. There are seven billion people in, uh, on this earth. How many of those do you think they have heard of the term or understand what Buddha nature is or understand and believe that they have Buddha nature? It's probably very little. Therefore, we definitely need to uh, propagate this teaching and we need to let others know about the teaching on Buddha nature and develop confidence that you will uh, definitely gain the Bodhi or achieve Bodhi. So it's necessary to share this teaching to the others. Um, according to the uh, Bodhisattva Charivatara, it says that just like mosquitoes and the uh, wasps and bees, as well as maggots, if they were to practice diligently, they will also attain supreme enlightenment. All kinds of insects, the wasps, mosquitoes, and bees, uh, as well as the maggots who dwells in the filth, they're considered as the most inferior of the insects even. However, if the conditions and causes were to mature for them, and with the diligence, they will definitely be able to attain supreme enlightenment as well. If they do not have the element of Buddha nature within them, how could they attain Buddha nature? They would not be able to re uh, reap any fruition at all. So all sentient beings have the opportunity to practice, because in all of our mind stream, there is the pure mind, uh, there is the pure Buddha nature uh, reside. Whatever knowledge you are learning, if you are guided by a good teacher, a virtuous teacher, and uh, the teacher with great capacity, then you would be able to um, develop such a kind of uh, such a kind of um, uh, knowledge. For example, if you have seven or eight teachers who teach you different languages since a young age, then you will be able to uh, study, and you would be fluent in those languages when you grow up. Similarly, if you were to meet a good teacher on the Dharma, then you would be able to further rediscover your uh, Buddha nature. Right now, the beings, let it be the, the beings from animal realm or human realm, the uh, Buddha nature is wrapped by the obscurations. 
Of course, we can see that there are different types of animals or birds. They can chant mantra as long as you teach them or train them. After training, even lions and um, tigers and wild horses and elephants, they can also perform, just like the kind of animals uh, in circuits. In certain trainings. So, this is the luminosity aspect of the Buddha nature. And that is shown through such kind of uh, qualities. If the sentient beings do not have Buddha nature, then it doesn't matter how much you, you train them, they won't be able to develop those skills. We see all kinds of circuit performances. The kind of shows that they would train the animals to perform various actions that human beings usually would take. And they are very successful at that. It is because they, all of those animals also have the intrinsic Buddha nature within. We should understand that. That's the seventh. Now the eighth. A, a woman of miserable appearance who is without protection and abides in poorhouse holds in her womb a glorious kin, not knowing that a lord of men dwells in her own body. So this one is the example meaning of the universal monarch and the woman, um, rather the mother. So it has both aspects, that is the example and the meaning. So a woman who's really miserable, who has a miserable appearance and complexion and abides in a very poor house, maybe a beggar, maybe a homeless woman who does not have any dwelling places or lives in a poor house, she would uh, sleep maybe just under some roof or maybe sleeps in a corridor of a bathroom. Uh, sleeps in some uh, really filthy and beaten up place. At the same time, this woman doesn't look beautiful. She has really miserable appearances. So such kind of a woman would be looked down at and taken very uh, lightly by the others under great discrimination. So such a, in, such a woman in inferior state, However, by some, uh, by some causes and conditions, she conceives a glorious king in her womb. Or uh, the child within her womb will become an universal monarch. So in the future, she will definitely be able to have a wonderful life. However, at this point, she has no idea that she is impregnated with an, an universal monarch. At the present stage, she will be uh, discriminated and she would be, uh, she would be living in a horrible situation. Just as in the, um, in the past, usually if a, if a maid is conceived uh, with a baby and then she would be be asked to leave by the uh, house masters. I remember that from the story of King Gisar. It's an epic story. I heard many different stories and different versions. So now I have no idea which one is a folklore and which one is the actual classic. I mean the classical ethic. Uh, there was once um, because Pamasambhava want to make connections and uh, uh, liberate sentient beings of Jambuvipa. So in appearance, uh, King Gisar's mother 
She came from the Naga's palace. Pamasambhava first went to the Naga's palace for various reasons. It's because it's a very long story. Anyhow, um, Pamasambhava went to the Naga's palace and then asked for uh, the daughter of the Naga king. But the f- the elder two the el- the two elder daughters were already married, and they were the two beautiful daughters. It was only the third daughter who was rather um, quite poor in her appearance. And the Naga king said, well, uh, this is very appropriate to send her to the human realm. So uh, that's how she went to the human world and then married to a rather lowly one as well. And she served as a maid to a very large and um, high status family. And later she was pre- impregnated um, and uh, she was she had um, King Gisar in her womb. There was this one snowy day that she was about to give birth. So she didn't go to the house and do her work. And then from the master's family, uh, there was this one very angry, um, angry man who came to find her. At that time, she gave birth to a really large egg. So when this person ran into her tent and she uh, stacked her knife into the egg and opened and break the egg, uh, and at that time, one of the uh, three uh, egged uh, children in her, uh, that she gave birth to um, flew into the celestial realm and uh, um, King Gisar stayed with the mother and uh, the younger son uh, was then flown uh, was then um, actually uh, went downstream because she, because the the uh, the other son uh, was thrown into a river, so uh, he was then raised by uh, women from another country, and they, there's another uh, warfare going on afterwards. Anyhow, at that time, just like Kim Gisar's mother had no idea that she was. Uh, the, going to be the mother of King Gisar, otherwise she doesn't have to suffer that much. She had no idea, and neither did anyone else. Therefore, this metaphor works very well. In, I remember that uh, around the 80s, when the religious practice was just to have a little bit um, space uh, or had a little bit opening in terms of the religious policies, uh, the first two books that was published, and uh, uh, it was the biography of Pamasambhava and the biography of uh, King Gisar, the epic of King Gisar, rather. So lots of people know how to how to sing the songs from King Gisar's play. At that time, the whole village was singing the songs from King Gisar. The, uh, even including all those uh, villagers as well as the authorities at the time, officials, because there are about 30 different ministers of King Gisar, and each of them would sing with a different tone. Some some people uh, prefer to dress up as certain ministers, and each minister has a different rhythm, different tone. I remember one of them who loved singing uh, the song of um, uh, Minister Chudong. There's another one. <laughs> okay, I'll stop here. Um, jokes, jokes aside, 
Now let's look at the uh, combination of the meaning and the example. Uh, and it says that a ruler of the earth dwell in the womb of a woman who has an unpleasant appearance and whose body is dressed in dirty clothes. She has to abide in a poor house and undergo the experience of direst suffering. Likewise, beings deem them unsheltered through a protector resides within their own minds. Thus, they have to abide in the ground of suffering, their minds being unpeaceful under the predominating drive of the mental poisons. So people don't really know that they already have such um, a precious element in their mind. Uh, oh, um, right. I forgot the, I forgot, I skipped the meaning part. Okay, so let me go back to the meaning. The meaning part says that birth in an existence is similar to the poorhouse. Impure beings are like the woman bearing a king in her womb. Since he is present within her, she has protection. The undefiled element is like the king who dwells in her womb. It's very similar. The meaning is very similar to the uh, example. Since the birth in various places of samsaric existence are accompanied by suffering, they are similar to living in a poor house, in abodes of those who have neither protection nor refuge. Since all beings are not uh, purified from the adventitious fabrications or afflictions, uh, have protection and refuge, and yet are ignorant of this. They are similar to the woman who has a king in her womb. Since a king is present within the woman, it will become apparent that she has protection. Since within uh, that beings, the true state, the Tathagatagarbha is present, they are accompanied by the best possible protection. The sentient beings sometimes are obscured by all kinds of afflictions, all kinds of dualistic thoughts, just like the poor woman who does not have any refuge, does not have any shelter. However, if you if you know that, um, if this poor woman were to know that uh, she has a king in her womb, then she doesn't have to fear at all. So we should understand that we don't have to experience such a suffering after knowing that we already have refuge and protection. So this is the reason why we need to understand uh, uh, the Buddha nature, which is quite crucial to uh, the sentient beings. Okay, so let's go over the next stanza again. It says that a ruler of the earth dwells in the womb of a woman who has an unpleasant appearance and whose body is dressed in dirty clothes. Just like an, a woman who has, who has unpleasant appearances, she already has an universal monarch in her womb. There are the gold universal monarch, the brass or the bronze universal monarch, the silver ones, and um, then there are the universal monarch who rules the three continents and so on and so forth. So um, this kind of king, this great universal monarch is already impregnated uh, to this woman, and this woman would have protection from then onwards. So look at the sentient beings in this world. Every one of them has to spend uh, their life in suffering, just like the poor woman. 
The poor woman, before knowing, before revealing that her son is, uh, before uh, her son becomes the the king, and then uh, she has to go through uh, lots of sufferings. Last year, uh, in the monastery. Uh, there was a token recognition, and then uh, we later on found that the mother uh, was pregnant during her uh, employment outside of the province when she was uh, working in different in different uh, in a different city. So it's really hard to say. Sometimes there are people who may appear to be rather harmful or displeasant in appearance, but maybe they'll turn out to be the mother of great kings or masters. That's why Mipa Rinpoche said that we should not look down at anyone, we should not treat anyone with disrespect. Sometimes we may feel that, oh, this person is very inferior, and that person is um, kind of mad. Maybe those people are the trans uh, are the um, manifestation of uh, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. I remember that there was once an official authority uh, was named, and then at that time people didn't really like him, so they uh, disrespected him. Um, but after a few years, he got promoted and became the head of all the uh, authorities. And then the kind of people who disrespected him uh, was definitely having a much harder time. So there are people who may appear to be inferior, and there are people who may appear uh, to be poor and unpleasant in their appearances, but we should not treat them with, um, with disrespect and so on. Similarly, if we see a mosquito or a little insect, if you were to kill that right now, just because a little mosquito looks very tiny and powerless, however, in the future, um, this mosquito will become the uh, 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 will uh, get enlightened and become a Buddha or Bodhisattva. In that way, just think about such causes and conditions. How are you going to endure the suffering that may cause to you? So it says that likewise, beings deem themselves unsheltered, though a protector resides within their own minds. Thus, they have to abide in the ground of suffering, their minds being unpeaceful under the predominating drive of the mental poisons. There are the beings, the sentient beings, um, who already have such mature conditions, they will know that they will be protected. Yet, since they do not know this, they deem themselves without any protection or refuge. Uh, thus, those beings whose minds are unpeaceful due to the predominating um, infuses of the mental poisons have to abide within the cycle of existence. They have to bear all those sufferings that occurs in the samsara, the ground of suffering. In our practice, if we were to develop a certainty of Buddha nature resides within, then we don't have to suffer that much, just as the metaphor, uh, the, the simile that's provided over here. According to the uh, Buddha Nature Sutra, it says that if one were to practice with great diligence, then soon enough one will be able to practice um, and 
attain the supreme fruition such as Buddhahood and uh, Bodhisattvahood. At that time, then you can liberate the immeasurable number of sentient beings. Though many people, I think, want to engage in the activity of liberating sentient beings. However, sometimes because of the limitation of their capacities, they cannot really uh, liberate others. Once you have developed the true, genuine bodhicitta, then you can liberate the sentient beings, and then liberating the others wouldn't be, wouldn't be too hard at all. So, next one, let's look at the example and meaning of the golden image and the clay. Uh, there are the three aspects or three parts as well, example, meaning, and both combined. Then, artistically well-designed image of a peaceful appearance which has been cast in gold and is still inside its mold, externally has the nature of clay. Experts upon seeing this will clear away the outer layer and cleanse the gold therein. This is the older technology or skill of building a statue out of a clay-made mold. The golden image that is very beautifully made and very um, and uh, uh, well designed in all its parts, very pure and beautiful in its peaceful appearances. It has been cast. It has been casted in gold, and still inside its black mold. It is covered by clay, and thus externally has the nature of the earth, the soil. Upon seeing this, experts who know that a golden image is contained in the covering mold. Uh, so such kind of expert will clear away the soil uh, on the outside layer in order to remove the traces of the clay remaining on the golden image enclosed within. Whenever we see a black soil or clay made of mold, we wouldn't even take a moment to guess that there might be a golden statue within. So this is the metaphor over here, but the experts, the experts would know. And the meaning is that likewise, those of supreme enlightenment fully see that there are defilements on the luminous nature, but that these stains are just adventitious and purify beings uh, who are like jewel mines from all their veils. So similarly, the victorious ones fully see that there are defilements on the luminous nature of the mind of beings. The nature of the beings are illuminous just like the uh, golden image and the afflictions appear just like the mold. So they both exist. Therefore, uh, just like how the golden image is being concealed by the mold, by the black mold, in order to reveal the nature of the sentient beings, then the victorious ones will clear away the obstruction of the afflictions. Um, so the victorious ones would give teachings of the Buddha Dharma so that the sentient beings would be able to attain great liberation, the great enlightenment. If the sentient beings have both the adventitious stains as well as the Buddha nature that is gold-like, uh, then in order to reveal such treasure within the Buddha give teaching so that the sentient beings would be able to clear away their stains and afflictions and be able to attain liberation. Uh, of course, there are the beings who are uh, rather dull and uh, would take them a longer time, but there are beings that's rather um, of a sharp capacity, for example, the story between the fourth and fifth patriarch. The fifth patriarch met the fourth patriarch when he was five years of age. Um, 
And the fourth patriarch asked him, asked the fifth, saying that, well, what family do, do you come from? And the young fifth patriarch said that, well, my family is impermanent. So what is your family? Asked again by the fourth patriarch. Uh, and then the fourth said, uh, the fifth patriarch said that um, I am from the Buddhist family because I have Buddha nature and it is uh, empty. It was rather a very profound conversation. Very interesting how it turned from asking where the uh, young fifth patriarch come from turned into a discussion on Buddha nature. Because of the sharp capacity of the fifth patriarch, the fourth patriarch went to the family of his and uh, asked him to uh, ask his family to uh, give permission so that the fifth patriarch can um, get ordained. And uh, uh, later on, he eventually became the fifth patriarch. So we can see that all the way from being impermanent to Buddha nature to the Buddha nature also being empty. It seems like a very simple question and answer, but it's indeed very profound. And the fifth patriarch eventually also received all the uh, blessings and teachings as well as a realization of the fourth patriarch. So uh, let's look at the the both combined explanation says that recognizing the nature of an image of peaceful appearances, um, flawless and made from shimmering gold, while it is still contained in its mold, an expert removes the layer of clay. So an expert would remove the black layer of the uh, clay mold. Likewise, the omniscient know the peaceful mind, which is similar to pure gold. The omniscient ones, after knowing that the peaceful mind or the nature within is pure and similar to gold, so remove the obscuration by teaching the Dharma just as the mold is struck and chipped away. So the mind that is the pure gold uh, image and the clay that refers to the uh, adventitious stain. So use all kinds of tools, that is, the teachings, the Dharma teachings, then all the mold and clay can chipped away, can be chi uh, chipped away and, cl and cleared away. Through various ways, um, all of these kind of adventitious stains can be removed. The Buddha knows that the sentient beings have the intrinsic golden image, that is the Buddha nature, though it's temporarily covered by adventitious stains, the Buddha would give ways or tools for the sentient beings' adventitious stains to be removed. So the tools refer to the Dharma teachings. Through this kind of method of Dharma teaching, the sentient beings' adventitious stains of afflictions can be chiseled away can be cleared away. So the Buddha said, all, out of all the nine kinds of um, methods or uh, examples, the similes, we can see that the method of removing the obscurations is through the Dharma teaching. Without Dharma teaching, our shell, our mold, uh, all the adventitious, of, uh, adventitious stains would not be able to be swept away even in hundreds and thousands of years. However, similarly, we can see that without the teaching and guidance by the 
spiritual friends, uh, by the gurus, by the teachings, then we would be bind into samsara for a very long period of time. According to the Buddha Nature Sutra, it says that I use my Buddha's eye to observe that the sentient beings are like such. This is the mind stream of sentient beings. Just like in the mud of affliction, all beings have Buddha nature within. So that refers to exactly what is taught over here. Therefore, over here it says that um, as a means to their removal, acting just the one who strikes the clay, chipping away to remove the mold, uh, they would uh, study and learning the various types and methods of teachings. I think after studying this, we would understand the teachings of the Dharma, uh, teachings given by the Buddha is indeed crucial in order to reveal the nature of uh, the Buddha nature within. So maybe one more verse? Okay. And then the next one is a summary of the meanings. The lotus, the bees, the husk, the filth, the earth, the skin of the fruit, the tethered rag, the woman's womb, and the shroud of clay exemplify the defilements while the pure nature is like the Buddha. So uh, the, the, the ugly lotus, the bees, the husk of grain, and the filthy mud, the ground, the skin of the fruit, the evil-smelling tethered rag, the woman's womb, and the shroud of black clay, the nine examples for the defilements causing the obscuration are summarized. Are these all the examples? Just to refer back, uh, the lotus has a Buddha statue within. While the um, pure nature is like the Buddha statue within the lotus, and then honey to the bee, and the kernel, and the, the gold to the uh, that is hidden under the filth, and uh, the treasure underneath the earth, and the great tree that is within the skin of the fruit. And um, the precious statue that is hidden in the tethered rag. I think you can refer back one on one, and then the next one is that universal monarch in the woman's womb, as well as the a golden image that is hidden in the shroud of clay. So those all refer to the Buddha nature. We should know that this is a summary. And then the Buddha taught, saying that it is said that the shroud of the mental poisons, which caused the veil of the element of beings, has had no connection with it since beginningless time, while the nature of mind, which is a void of stains, has been present within them since beginningless time. So, what's the connection between affliction and uh, Buddha nature. In fact, they are not one, they're not the same thing, and they're not uh, one giving birth to another. However, they are 
existence existent from beginningless time. They had no connection with it, with each other since beginningless time. However, they've been present within each other since beginningless time. It says that the nature of mind is luminous, and such kind of luminous mind by accident is being defiled, and the event, adventitious stains are temporary. They are not one with the Buddha nature. It's not that we can't peel them off. It's not like that uh, the stains are the same as the Buddha nature or within the Buddha nature. Because adventitious stains also do not have any nature of their own. According to the Mahayana's teaching on the Six, Par Six Par uh, Prajna Paramita Sutra, it says that the uh, Taragata's pure treasure is uh, devoid of all kinds of characteristics. Uh, Such characteristics the true nature of uh, Buddha nature has all the qualities uh, that numbers of the uh, numbers of Ganges, numbers of the sands of Ganges rivers of the Buddha's Dharmakaya. Therefore, we can see that the nature has uh, is not the same as the adventitious stains. There are people who would attain enlightenment uh, upon hearing the nature, uh, the teaching on the nature, and there are the ones who would attain uh, enlightenment when they hear the teachings on the adventitious stains. Everyone's very different. There are people who attained liberation, for example, Avalokiteshvara uh, attained liberation based on the teaching given on uh, the form. And then uh, Cordina, Cordinia attained liberation based on the teaching of uh, given on adventitious stains. So adventitious, he was thinking that since adventitious is like a guest, then who is the owner, who is the master that the adventitious stains um, belong to? Then he questions himself and contemplated upon that and then attended liber uh, attend enlightenment. So I believe that there are people who's going to attain liberation based on different types of teachings, um, maybe based on the, uh, maybe because of the teaching on uh, Buddha nature, maybe uh, teachings on uh, the flight of the Garuda, and then um, for example, I remember uh, back last uh, back the year before on the 26th, I was giving teachings on the uh, Buddha nature on uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra, and then 27th, I believe it was um, the uh, Pachurin Buche's teaching on the three strikes, and then uh, the 28th was the final teaching of the flight of the Garuda. So, how many of you have attained? enlightenment now. Um, I understand that many of you who vowed to read uh, the treasure of Dharmadhatu many times uh, when you first received it, but after that, how many of you actually revisited that book and reviewed that teaching? Uh, let's look at Cordinia, who uh, constantly co uh, contemplated on what is adventitious and then recognized the nature of his own mind and attained enlightenment at that time. So let it be Shrangama Sutra, the Vimalakirti Sutra, so many bodhisattvas and arhats who, upon receiving a very simple teaching and then attained fruition, uh, then you can do that as well. Let's look at the great masters of uh, the uh, 
of the cities of India, they would hear certain words and then they would attain enlightenment. Because we all have a Buddha nature, then eventually we will also attain enlightenment based on maybe a simple teaching. So we should have faith in that. Mm-hmm.